Hello, good day, mentors, and welcome to our session for Ed 319, the teacher and the school curriculum. This is under Unit 3 of our module, Phases and Process of Curriculum Development. I am Sir Fitz, your Ed 319 facilitator. For Unit 3 on Phases and Process of Curriculum Development, these will be our intended learning outcomes. At the end of this unit, you as pre-service teachers must have demonstrated the knowledge of curriculum planning, design and organization, implementation, evaluation and improvement, and you must have prepared developmentally sequenced lesson plans with well-aligned learning outcomes and competencies based on curriculum requirements. Let us begin. According to Charles Handy, instead of a national curriculum for education, what is really needed is an individual curriculum for every child. No two individual is alike. Therefore, we have to prepare different activities. We have to prepare different strategies or methods. If you have 50 students in your classroom, you need to prepare, uh, you need to prepare rather 50 sets of strategies. We will be focusing with lesson one, the foundation or rudiments of what curriculum designing is. And I'll bring you to Peter Oliva's 10 actions for curriculum designers. Action number one, curriculum change is inevitable, necessary, and desirable. Whether we like it or not, we have to change the curriculum. It is also important and it is likable. Earlier, it was stated that one of the characteristics of curriculum is its being dynamic. It has to be active. It depends upon the needs and expectations of our society or community. The curriculum in the past may not be suited at present because there is or there are new knowledge, there are different perspectives, and the nature of learners has evolved. Because of this, teachers should respond to the changes that occur in schools and its context. Societal development and knowledge revolution come so fast that the need to address the changing condition requires new curriculum designs. That is why, whether we like it or not, we have to alter, we have to change, we have to modify because it is inevitable. It is also important and it is desirable or likable. Second action, according to Oliva, is that curriculum reflects as a product of its time. And this is called also, uh, this is what we call timeliness. That is, what characteristic of curriculum? Relevance. It should respond to changes brought about by current social forces, philosophical positions, psychological principles, new knowledge, and educational reforms. With a new normal academic setup, um, it is, it was not expected at all that this pandemic will happen. But because it happens, we have to alter something from our curriculum, especially for the learning modalities that we have to use, that universities like City or Gao campus will have to do pure learning, electronic, to produce e- or online modules for all of our students. And we have to respond to changes brought about this pandemic, and that is inevitable that is significant or important the third action it changes made earlier can exist concurrently with newer curriculum changes what's that a revision in a curriculum starts and ends slowly more often curriculum is gradually phased in and phased out thus the change that of course can coexist and oftentimes overlaps for long periods of time we have Actually, the uh, different sets of or different curricula, uh, curricula in the Philippines. But it actually overlaps. Um, what the technical working group is doing is there is enhancement or modification from the previous curriculum. And the curriculum change depends on people who will implement the change. So teachers will implement the curriculum should be involved in its development. Hence, you should know 
a teacher should know how to design a curriculum. And teachers should be members of the technical working group of the committee who will be designing the curriculum. Because the teachers are the implementers of the curriculum and it is best that they should design and own the changes. This will assure an effective and long-lasting change. And one of the members of the technical working group should be teachers because they are the primary implementers of the curriculum aside from the principal, aside from the school head, aside from the supervisor, aside from the curriculum experts, and aside from the stakeholders like the students, the parents, the political sectors, the private sectors, and the religious sectors. Fifth, curriculum development is a collaborative or cooperative group activity. It is not, it's not a work of one person. It's not a work of one entity or sole in entity. It needs group decisions in some aspects of curriculum development, which are suggested. Consultations with stakeholders like the political, like the religious, like the, uh, the, the laymen or ordinary members of the community, like the students when possible, will add to a sense of ownership. Even learners should participate in some aspect of curriculum designing. Any significant change in the curriculum should involve a broad range of stakeholders, gain understanding, support, and input. If we will have to enhance the curriculum for hospitality management, for example, we need also to invite, aside from parents, teachers, supervisors, curriculum experts, are our industry partners because they know the competencies needed by these prospective workers in the hospitality industry. If we are to enhance the teacher education curriculum, we need also to invite personalities from the Department of Education because the DepEd is the end users of the prospective professional teachers produced by the teacher education institution like in CTU, Argao. Sixth, curriculum development is a decision-making process made from the choices of alternatives. We decide what particular content should be included and criteria must be considered. Philosophy or point of view to support how to provide for multicultural groups. If we are using this particular curricular model, who was the or who is the proponent? Who is the author? What methods or strategies is it research based? And what type of evaluation? So wrong spelling. Please correct that word. It's E V A L A, eval E V A L A uh, L U A T I O N evaluation to use. And it is a decision-making process. Our curriculum in the K-12 is a product of, of experiments, of trial and error for years, of pilot testing. It is a research-based activity. We do not just um, choose automatically, okay, hey, uh, we, uh, we, we have to like A-12 to because that is used by America, that is used by Australia, that is used by Canada. So it's not like that, but it is based on a research study. So it is a decision-making process made from the choices of alternatives. It is an ongoing process. Curriculum development is incomplete. Just like our syllabus, one good characteristic of a syllabus, it has to be incomplete. You can insert something along the way. Continuous monitoring, examination, evaluation, and improvement of curricula are to be considered in the design of the curriculum. As the needs of the learners change, as society changes, and as new knowledge and technology appear, the curriculum must change. And regularly, our curricul uh, curriculum is revisited by the technical working group. It is uh, uh, the enhancement and the improvement of our current curriculum is a product of a continuous monitoring, examination, evaluation. It is not, uh, okay, we have this particular curriculum and let's see after 10 years. No, it's not like that. It's a regular monitoring and examination, especially for new implementation, the first year of implementation or the first two years, three years, four years, five years of its implementation. We have to regularly check its effectiveness. Curriculum is more effective if it is a comprehensive process. We have to see the holistic perspective, not the piecemeal. If we are to bake a particular cake, we have to see 
the product first. We have to see the entire cake before we have to gather ingredients and we have to follow procedures. A curriculum design should be based on a careful plan, intended outcomes, clearly established, support resources, and needed time available, and teaching staff pedagogically equipped. If you are to construct your, your dream house, you have to see the blueprint first of your entire dream house before starting to construct them before gathering or buying or purchasing materials for the um, dream house construction we have to see the comprehensive process first rather than the piecemeal we begin with an end in mind Ninth, curriculum development is more effective when, when it follows a systematic process. It is composed of desired outcomes, subject matter content, complemented with references, a set of procedures, needed materials and resources, and evaluation procedure, which can be placed in a matrix. And it's, it's, it follows step-by-step -step procedure, making it systematic. Okay? So outcomes must be chosen. And how this anchored on competencies set by the Department of Education. And these competencies are anchored on the VMGO of the department. And the VMGO of the DepEd is based on the point agenda of the administration and the vision of the present administration of the Republic of the Philippines. Ana ang dagan in the, pro, uh, the, the designing of our curriculum. Last, Aksyom. According to Oliva, curriculum development starts from where the curriculum is. Curriculum planners and designers begin with an existing curriculum. An existing design is a good starting point for any teacher who plans to enhance and enrich a curriculum. Our curriculum now is, a, is actually an enhancement or improvement of the previous curriculum. It starts from where the curriculum is. An existing design is a good starting point. That is why we have to be grateful to our past members of the technical working group of our ancestors with the evolution of education that we have right now because we are enjoying the goodness of our ancestors, the past administration, the past members of our technical working group because of the enhancement that we have enjoyed with our present curriculum of our country. To continue, let's have the elements or components of a curriculum design. The minuscule curriculum is the lesson plan in which this particular plan is actually implemented in our classroom. So what are the parts or elements or components of a curriculum design like, for example, a lesson plan. The first is, the first part is behavioral objectives or intended learning outcomes. We begin with an end in view, which means that we have to begin with what is expected by our students to be achieved at the end of the unit or at, after the session. The objectives that's the old term. Now it is called the ILO. The ILO in the OBDIS teaching learning process, we come to use outcomes or desired or intended learning outcomes. It is desired learning outcome that is to be accomplished in a particular learning episode engaged in by the learners under the guidance of the teacher as a designer of a curriculum the beginning of the learning journey is the learning outcomes to be achieved in this way both the learner and the teacher are guided by what to accomplish meaning um it is or these are the items that we need to present to our students directly or indirectly in the first part of our the delivery no or when we be uh, prior to the lesson presentation or lesson development these objectives must be presented to our students or outcomes must be presented to our students so that they will know uh, we begin with an end in view they have to know Nga magunsa ko at the end or maunsa ko at the end of the semester of the unit. 
Behavioral objectives, intended learning outcomes, or the DLO or desired learning outcomes are expressed in action words. And these words and these objectives should be observable. It must be seen. And it, it is found in the revised Bloom's Taxonomy of Objectives of Anderson and Craftwell 2003 for the development of the cognitive skills. For the affective skills, it's the taxonomy of Craftwell. And for the psychomotor, it is of or by Simpson. The statement of our objectives must be S specific. It must be clear. Second, it must be measurable, meaning it can be evaluated. It can be assessed. Third, attainable. It must be doable. And it must be result-oriented or output-oriented and the time-bound or its time element. For a beginner, it would help if you provide a condition. Like for example, if your topic is in, uh, is the parts of the flower no, in science, the condition is with uh, an example is within an hour of collaborative learning activity and lecture discussion. That's your condition. That is going to be done by your students. Then the performance and extent level of performance. So within an hour of, lect of lecture dis discussion and collaborative learning activity, students with 80% accuracy must have. Why do I say so? Why not 80% of the students? When I say 80% of the students, I am leaving behind the 20% because it's 80% of the students. But I restate it into students with 80% accuracy level, meaning I am accommodating all of my students. But all of these students uh, may have at least 80% accuracy level in the statement of the int intended learning outcomes. For example, a lesson intends the students to identify parts of a simple flower or stated in a desired learning outcome should be must have because this is the end. They must have identified the parts of a simple flower, a flower which is not an objective but an outcome. Sometimes the phrase intended learning outcomes is used to refer to the anticipated results after completing the planned activity or lesson. In framing learning outcomes, it is good to practice to express each outcome in terms of what successful students will be able to do. For example, rather than stating students will be able to explain the reason why, it should be students must have explained the reason why because that is the, we are referring here to the anticipated results after completing the planned activity. This helps students to focus on what they have to achieve as learning. And it will also help curricularists devise appropriate assessment tasks based on the outcome. And it includes different kinds of, of outcomes. One, cognitive outcomes. These are the facts, the theories, the formula, the principles which set as foundation for performance outcomes like learning how to carry out procedures, calculation, and processes, which typically include gathering information and communicating results. And in some contexts, affective outcomes are important too because it develops attitude or values those required as a person and for a particular profession. In the making, in the formulation of behavioral or of intended learning outcomes, you have to consider thinking, feeling, and doing. Second component of our lesson plan or of the, the second component or element of a curriculum design is content or the subject matter. In the lesson plan, which is part of our lesson plan, it includes subject matter or the topic or the content and then the method, uh, the skill focus, the method or the strategy, the values integration, and the references. Though it's third part no, in the in the in the um in the element no, later on. So subject matter should be relevant to the outcomes of the curriculum. An effective curriculum is purposive, clearly focused on the planned learning outcomes. And our objective should come from our outcomes. Mga no man nga parts of the flower mangko because my outcome is um they have must have identified pa the, the parts of a simple flower. 
So that is why my subject matter are parts of a simple flower. Subject matter should be appropriate to the level of the lesson or unit. An effective curriculum is progressive, it is dynamic, it is active, leading students towards building on previous lessons. Contents which are too basic or too advanced for the development level of learners make students either bored or baffled and affect their motivation to learn. If you are handling students under first section or pilot section, you better provide them with challenging activities. And you may have another set of activities for students under the second, third, or in the lower sections. Subject matter should be up to date and if possible should reflect current knowledge and concepts. We have to insert trends and issues. The, the present matters of our society, of our community. These are what we call the teachable moments. If we are, we are now in the pandemic, so you have to insert something, issues and concerns about the pandemic. That is um, the subject matter being up to date and if possible, it re uh, and it reflects really the current um, happening or the current knowledge and concepts. Third is references, though it's, it's part of the content of the, of the subject matter. It follows the content. Why? Because it tells where the content or subject matter has been taken. The reference may be a book, a module, or any publication. It must bear the author of the material and, if possible, the publications. An example is when we write references, so we have to use the APA, the American Psychological Association for, uh, format. That's the APA format. So we start with the author. The year published, the title of the book, the journal, or the title of that particular website, and then the publisher, and then the location of the publisher. If it's an in internet um, source, so the author, the year it is published in, uh, via online, and then the title of that particular site or of that particular article, and then retrieve from the URL dates of retrieval. Okay, so that is an example. The fourth are the teaching and learning methods. And these are the activities where the learners derive experiences. It is always good to keep in mind the teaching strategies that students will have to experience. Like, for example, lectures, laboratory classes, field work, and make them learn. The method should allow cooperation, competition, as well as individualism or independent learning among the students. The bottom line is there is no single best method. It should be eclectic. It should be combination. So we go with cooperation, we go with individualistic, or we go with independent, we go with competition. We Sometimes we go with lecture and then laboratory and then field work. So it is a combination or it is eclectic. Example is cooper uh, cooperative learning activities. The Department of Education now is encouraging um, teachers to use the collaborative learning activities. Why? Because the DepEd is advocating peace education. And in this particular activity, we allow students to work together. That is, um, by, uh, by harmonizing, by unifying, uh, by appreciating the differences that we have. Students are guided to learn on their own to find solutions to their problems. Usually, outputs are done by group or they are collabora uh, collaboratively done. The role of the teachers is to guide the learners. Democratic process is encouraged and each one contributes to the success of the learning. Students learn from each other in ways. Group projects and activities considerably enhance the curriculum. In this in the new normal academic setup, can we still have collaborative learning activities in our synchronous class? We have breakout sessions in rooms in Zoom. We can have collaborative learning activities in the uh, messenger group chat. Diba? So we can still conduct collaborative learning activities. Another method, TLM, is independent learning activities. It allows learners to develop personal responsibility. For shared responsibility, that is for co co cooperative learning activities. But we have also to develop students' personal responsibility. I have to do this um, independently because I, am I have to be responsible for 
me to submit that to my teacher. The degree of independence to learn how to learn is enhanced. This strategy is more appropriate for fast learners. Third is competitive activities where students will test their competencies against another in a healthy manner, allowing students to perform to their maximum. Remember that after graduation, they will be leaving the portal of their school and they will be facing the competitive world of work. Most successful individuals in their adult life are competitive even in early schooling. So we have to expose them with competition as long as the competition is healthy. They mostly become the survivors in a very competitive world. The use of various delivery modes to provide learning experiences is recommended. Online learning and similar modes are increasingly important in many curricula, but these need to be planned carefully to be effective. Especially what we are experiencing right now, the pandemic um, forced universities to purchase learning management system or teachers to use learning management system by implementing flexible learning and blended learning. So that is another, uh, that's another method. The last part is assessment and evaluation. Okay, you have your intended learning outcomes, but the question is, are they attained? Are they achieved? And that question can be answered in the fifth component of the curriculum design. Learning occurs most effectively when students receive feedback. When they receive information on what they have and have not already learned, the process by which this information is generated is assessment. And what are the three main forms of assessment and evaluation? We go first with self-assessment. That is why we have reflective learning sheets. We have takeaway journal. We have self-activities through which a student learns to monitor and evaluate their own learning self-rating. This should be a significant element in the curriculum because we aim to produce graduates who are appropriately reflective and self-critical. Unang usahay na self-rating, we have self-assessment because we want to produce students who are reflective and self-critical. Second main form is the peer assessment. What's that? Students provide feedback on each other's learning. This can be achieved as an extension of self-assessment and presupposes trust and mutual respect. Research suggests that students can learn to judge each other's work as reliably as staff. And third is the teacher assessment or my assessment in which the teacher prepares and administers tests and give feedback on the student's performance. Assessment may be formative and the formative assessment provides feedback to help the students learn more. Or summative exam which expresses judgment and students' achievement by reference to stated criteria. Many ass assessment tasks involve an element of both an assi assignment that is marked and returned to the student with detailed comments. As teachers, we have to give timely feedback for our students so that they will know asaman ko nasayop and so that they can correct immediately. The summative assessment usually involves the allocation of marks or grades. This helps the teacher make decisions about the progress or performance of our students. But we have also to emphasize our students that the scores that they will get in a test does not reflect their entire personality, but it could be a part no, of the effort that they have exerted in that particular lesson or in that particular session or unit. Students usually learn more by understanding the strengths and weaknesses of their work than by knowing the mark or grade given to it. So they have to weigh and decide, uh, in a, well, I have not exerted an effort. That is why I have gotten low score. For this reason, summative assessment tasks, including unseen examinations, should include an element of formative feedback if possible. With this particular session, you are to answer independent learning task number eight, and that is finding an example. You are to secure a copy of a sample lesson plan. So you may contact virtually a teacher or a neighbor, a teacher who is a neighbor, to secure a copy of a, of a DLP or of a lesson plan. And using the matrix, you are to analyze the sample you, you secured like um, by filling up the components, copy from the sample, your comments, and your suggestions based on the principles and concepts you learned in this lesson. Do not carry out collaborative learning tasks. Only IL, 
CLT number eight, no CLT number six. But you answer refle self reflect. Okay? So this is based on your answer in ILT number eight. Remember that when educating the minds of our youth, we must not forget to educate their hearts. Again, do not just focus with thinking and doing, but we have to focus also with the feeling. And that is the integration of values. A child educated only by heart or a child educated only by mind, not by heart, is no education at all. Thank you for listening and good day.